Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. You can take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 9. That's where we'll start this morning as I begin this series of messages entitled The Heart of Christmas. We're going to talk about the heart of Christmas as hope, it's peace, it's joy, and it's love. Each one of these things are promised to us through the coming of the Christ child, Jesus Christ. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, John wrote, and we beheld His glory, the glory is of the only begotten Father. He goes on to say that He was full of grace and full of truth. So when we hear those scriptures about Jesus, we have to rejoice because our Savior has come. The Messiah is here, no longer awaited for, but he is here. So when we look at this passage from Isaiah chapter 9, we recognize that this is one of the most classic passages in the Old Testament about the birth of Christ. Isaiah is writing in a time of gloom, despair, sinfulness has swept across the land. Darkness is covering Israel. And when Isaiah, what Isaiah offered in chapter 9 was something the Jewish people needed more than anything else, and that something was hope. They needed hope in that dark time, in that dark day. Hope that someday one would come and restore Israel to what God had created it to be, to restore all the broken and misplaced pieces and parts and bring it back together. And we know from Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And we know that, in fact, he offers hope into our lives today. When there is no hope from any other source, when man medicine can't help us, when the banker can't see our way out of the problem, when we don't understand it, our employer is not sympathetic, there is still hope in Jesus Christ. There's hope in him. And I'm pretty sure that this Christmas season, almost everybody in this room could use a new dose of hope. Amen? You know, I was thinking about this as I was preparing these notes, and I realized that nothing speaks of hope like a child or a grandchild preparing that Christmas list. I mean, they are so hopeful. Our grandkids don't give us one thing. They give us 99. And Yvonne has to say, pick the one you really want. You know, Amazon's an amazing thing. You don't even have to go to the store anymore. She sits in the living room and does all that and has it delivered to Oklahoma City. It's an amazing thing. I remember when we had to carry the gifts in the back of the car and hope we had room for luggage too, but now we don't do that, do we? And then I began thinking about my oldest son, Chris, when he was probably three or four, I don't remember exactly. We asked him, what do you want for Christmas? And he said, I want a banana. And I'm thinking, a banana? That's a little bit odd. We have bananas on the counter, son. No, I want a banana. So we wrapped a banana in a box and put his name on it. And when he opened it, you could see the disappointment flood his face and tears began to flow. And I said, what's the matter? You said you wanted a banana. No, I want a banana. I said, well, tell me what you mean. I want a banana like the cowboys wear. He was saying bandana, but he thought in his mind, but he was saying banana. I went back to the bedroom, I had a big old bandana in my drawer, folded it properly, tied a knot in the back, put it in another box, and walked out and said, why don't you open this one? Maybe this one's right. When he opened that box, his face lit up with joy. He said, yes, it's a banana that I wanted, just like this one. It's amazing, isn't it? Hope and joy. Look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, and then verses 6 and 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Did you hear that phrase? Those who have dealt in the land of the shadow of death, his light has shined upon them. They've seen a great light. Verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throat of David and over his kingdom to order, establish it with the judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I read those scriptures and I think, my goodness, that could be us today. A people living in a place of great darkness, overshadowed by the evil that's happening around us. We see those passages and then we have to realize in in the next verse, verse 7, that the only time we'll know peace on earth is when Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne in the temple in Jerusalem and he's ruling and reigning this planet. Then we will know peace on earth. But until then, it doesn't matter who's president or prime minister. It doesn't matter who is actually in those places of power. I'm not saying your vote doesn't matter. You need to vote. But I'm saying the darkness is so great over our land. Satan has such a hold on our leaders by and large, that we have to understand our hope and our help doesn't come from Washington or Tallahassee. Our hope and our help comes from the living God of the universe, whose name is Jesus Christ. Yes, we're good citizens. Yes, we're involved. But listen to me. If you hang all your hope upon a politician, you're setting yourself up for failure. Setting yourself up for disappointment. But if you will hang your hope on the King of kings and the Lord of lords, on the name that's above every name, on the one who was and is and is to come, the Almighty, upon the one who said, I was alive and dead, but now I am alive again. If you'll put your hope in Him, you'll never be disappointed. Amen. I tell you, I never understand this. Thanksgiving weekend and rain, people just can't seem to make it out of their house. It's amazing, isn't it? Listen to me today. Those of you online, and there are many because you're not in the house, you need to hear me that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. Our hope is in what Isaiah described, the coming of the Messiah, and His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The backdrop of Isaiah's writings, and he wrote this passage around 740 B.C. The backdrop was poor leadership over Israel, and they'd had it for several generations. They'd had four very wicked and evil kings in succession. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. They were corrupt, sinful men, and they led people astray. Listen to me. When corrupt and sinful men are in power, they lead nations astray. They take them into places of darkness. They take them places of deceit. You and I need to pray today, God, raise up righteous leaders in this land so that they can lead us back into righteousness. Amen. These men were corrupt. It was a very dark time in the history of Israel. And Isaiah wrote these words knowing that in order for Israel to be turned around, God must intervene. May I say to you today, the only hope for this society, this culture, this nation is for God to intervene again today. The only hope is for an outpouring of the Spirit of God upon the heart of God's people that causes us to become fervent, on fire, consumed with the message of the cross and taking it to the entire world. See, we're we're more than willing to give as well as someone else goes. We're more than willing to give as well as someone as long as someone else is taking the risks and paying the price. I've come to tell you today, the only way this nation will turn around is for the people of God to be so filled with the Spirit that we rise up and declare, this is the way, walk ye in it. Isaiah knew that was the only hope for his nation. He had to turn Israel back to himself. And then I think about what Paul wrote in the the book of Colossians. In chapter 1, verse 20, he said, and I'm reading this from the message because I love this translation. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, atoms and animals and atoms, 
yet properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death and his blood that poured down from the cross. How are we reconciled? How are we unified? Only through the cross of Jesus Christ. My friend, as long as evil men are leading this nation, they lead us away from the cross. They lead us away from the truth of the gospel. But God is calling you and I one more time to stand up and declare through the cross and the blood that was shed on the cross, there is unity, there is solidarity among the people of God. I've said it a million times, I'm going to say it again. There's only one place where we're equal, and that's at the foot of the cross. Man and the systems of man engineered by Satan are meant to be divisive and to separate people. But the cross has one purpose and one intent. That's forgiveness, renewal, restoration, and unity through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's time for us to recognize we don't have to be divided. We can be unified when we come by way of the cross. Colossians 2.9, he went on to say, Everything of God gets expressed in him, speaking of Jesus, so you can see and hear him clearly. I love this line. You don't need a telescope or a microscope or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. I'm going to say it again. You don't need a telescope or a microscope or a horoscope to realize the fullness of God in Christ Jesus. He is our hope in uncertain times. When we read these scriptures from Isaiah, he makes two major acknowledgments. Number one, he acknowledges the brokenness and darkness that surround Israel due to sin and corruption. I said it last week, I'm going to say it again. Faith never denies facts, but faith looks in the face of facts and says, it's not always going to be this way. There is a change coming. There is hope coming. There is joy coming. There is peace coming. There is love flowing. Oh, somebody get with me today. It's time to recognize there is hope in Jesus Christ. So how do we define hope? Hope is expectation. Hope is expectation. Hope is believing earnestly, having a confidence deep within our spirit that what God declared, God was going to do. Second thing he said, he didn't deny what was happening. Second thing he said was, there is a hope of a dawning light through the birth of a child who would one day make things right. Through the birth of a child that would one day make things right. The Jewish people of Isaiah's day needed to hear these words. They needed to be reminded that God had not forgotten them. Some of you in this room, some of you online need to be reminded God has not forgotten you. He hasn't overlooked you. He hasn't misplaced you. He didn't lose your address. He no longer has your phone number. No, he knows you. Not only does he know you, he knows the number of hairs that are on your head. He understands you. He said, I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. Oh, it's time to recognize he has not abandoned you. He is there all the time. And hope springs eternal that is in my heart and in my life. Matthew made the connection between what Isaiah had prophetically written and what happened in a stable in Bethlehem. You can read it in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And it says these words, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now understand the background. Joseph, who was engaged to Mary, had just found out that Mary was pregnant, and he knew he wasn't the father. So the Bible tells us he was considering, contemplating, thinking about what to do with her. And he thought about just putting her away, not making a big deal of it, severing the engagement and moving on with his life. And in that position and in that place when he was thinking about that, the Lord appeared to him in a dream. You can read it in Matthew 1.20. And he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, marry your wife. For what, what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And then we read the text, and she shall bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. And all this was done to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. 
It's an amazing thing the way the scripture weaves together. I have people tell me frequently, I don't read the Old Testament. It's not for me. I'm a New Testament believer. May I tell you, you'll never understand the New Testament until you go back and read the Old Testament, until you see the foreshadowing, until you see the prophetic word, until you understand that God had a plan before he created this world, before he created Adam, before he created Eve, he had a plan to deal with the sin that would infect mankind and his plan and his remedy came through a son, a child born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin whose name is Jesus. Oh, folks, that's something to be excited about. Joseph was planning to call everything off because Mary had been unfaithful, unfaithful. And then the Lord spoke to him in a dream and said, no, buddy, that's not the way to go. Don't worry about it. She hasn't been unfaithful to you. She is being faithful to me. And what's in her was conceived by the Holy Ghost. And then we go on to read that this child would be named Emmanuel, which means God with us. May I tell you, in Jesus Christ there is hope even in darkness because his name is Jesus, he'll save his people from their sins. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, can somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are Jesus. Thank you that you are Emmanuel. Thank you that you are God with us. And not only that, God in us. Three things I want to give you, then I'm done. Number one, the presence of darkness always threatens our hope. The presence of darkness always threatens our hope. Jesus was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy to the Israelites. Their hope that one day God would push back the darkness and shine a bright light into the world. And in John chapter 1 verse 14, John wrote it this way, In him was life, and that life was the light of man. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm here to tell you, if you've got Jesus in your heart, you've got life and you've got light. You cannot be silent. You can't put a bushel over it. You've got to stand and declare it. There is one God. There is one who is holy and righteous and true. There's only one born of a virgin. Only one lived a sinful life. Only one died for my sins. And only one rose again from the grave. And his name is Jesus don't know if that was the gospel on the thumbnail, that Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinful life, died a substitutionary death on the cross, and rose again from the dead. That's the good news that we have to share. The presence of darkness threatens our hope, but the presence of Jesus pushes back the darkness. Listen, if we turned every light off on this place and I just lit a candle, that light would push the darkness back. You need to understand that every day you step into society, every day you live as a believer full of the Holy Ghost, you are doing what you've been commanded to do, and that's letting your light shine so that all men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Oh, come on, folks, don't be afraid of the darkness, but push into it. Be a light that shines. One of the reasons Christmas resonates in our hearts is because we live in a dark, corrupt world. A world that is so entangled by sin. There's war, there's disease, there's conflict, oppression all around us. And we need Jesus to light us up to push through the darkness. This season is a reminder that we have hope in our lives. No matter what you're looking for, whether it's forgiveness or healing or restoration or a fresh start, it is available through Emmanuel, God with us. Hope is not the result of an absence of conflict, difficulty, struggles, or trials. Hope is the result of the presence of God. Oh, come on, put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. He never fails. He never disappoints. Number two, God's presence has come to give us hope. The hard part about hope is it doesn't work on our timeline. 
Sometimes it takes longer than we think it should. Sometimes it takes longer than we hoped it would. Like the people of Isaiah's day. They're living in darkness and corruption. And they long to see hope rise again through the light of the Christ child. It requires patience sometimes to see that hope arise within us. So may I encourage you, let patience have her perfect work. That you may be thoroughly, thoroughly and completely clothed in the righteousness and in the light of God. When Isaiah wrote these words, he saw that one day in the future, God would bring a great light and salvation through the birth of a child. And it wasn't until hundreds of years later that Matthew recorded Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. But when he did, we need to understand his name is Emmanuel, God with us. So Jesus was the presence of God on this planet. And he offers forgiveness, the destruction of evil, and the promise of eternal life. I read that scripture and I think again of Romans chapter 4. When it says of Abram, verses 20 and 21, he staggered not at the promise of God because of unbelief, but was strong in faith, believing, hear me, believing that what God promised, he was able also to perform. I'm speaking to somebody in this room today. Don't give up hope. Believe that what he promised, he will bring about in your life. Believe that he will honor your faith. Romans 15, Paul made an appeal to those who Trust in Christ. I want to read it to you. Verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You hear what he said? He said everything that was written before was written so that we would have hope in this life today. Every prophecy and the fulfillment of those prophecies are meant to teach us how to hold on to God in patience and endurance. What has been written, he said, gives us endurance and encouragement. It's important that when we hear these words, we go back and revisit the Old Testament and recognize that the fulfillment of those Messianic prophecies comes through Jesus Christ. And that in darkness, we have a God who can be trusted. And when we trust him in the darkness, hope springs up in our hearts and in our lives. Think about it this way. When I choose to enter his courts with thanksgiving, when I choose to come to his courts with praise, when I choose to focus on him and not on me, when I begin to open my mouth and begin to sing and worship him, when that begins to occur and I shift my focus from what I see out here to who I see up there, then suddenly hope begins to arise within me. I begin to realize I will get through this. I will overcome this. I will, I will see God's will done in my life. Oh, some Somebody, come on today. It's time to recognize there is hope in the darkness. Hope in the darkness. And God can be trusted to see us through our greatest needs. And number three, Tom, would you come back? At the heart of Christmas is hope. This message is just a simple reminder. A simple reminder that Jesus arrived in a manger, in a barn in a stable. His arrival was not what was anticipated or expected by the Jewish people. His arrival didn't come with fanfare and trumpets and banners. His arrival was marked by, we don't have any room for you in the inn, but there's a barn out back. You can at least find shelter. And we see the manger of some wooden cradle. Really, it was a piece of rock that the center had been hollowed out as a feed trough for the animals. And it was in that feed trough that Mary wrapped him after he was born and laid him in that manger. Folks, we've got to realize that so often what we're looking for isn't what we're going to see. And we've got to see through the eyes of God. So often we're looking for banners and trumpets and fanfares when in fact he's already here. All we have to do is pick him up, receive him, let him come into our lives and bring hope into our hearts. Years ago I read the story about an elderly lady 
Her name was Stella Thornhope. Good name. She was struggling because it was her first Christmas alone. Her husband had died just a few months ago. He suffered with a protracted illness, cancer that finally claimed his life. Several days before Christmas, she was in despair. Heavy snow came. She was almost snowed in, couldn't get out of her house. She felt alone. She didn't have the desire to even decorate anything for Christmas. And late that afternoon, when she was wallowing in her despair, the doorbell rang. There was a young man there. He had a box under his arm, and he said, I need you to sign for this package. She invited him in because it was cold outside. She didn't want the air coming on into the house. Shut the door. She signed for the box and then asked him, what's inside the box? The young man smiled and opened the flaps, picked up a 12-week golden Labrador. Just a puppy full of life, full of energy. And he explained, this pup is for you, ma'am. 12 weeks old, house broken. It's a gift to you. Miss Thornhope said, but who sent this? I don't understand. Who sent this? The ant man set the animal down, handed her a letter, said everything's explained in the letter. And here's a book to help you know how to care for your Labrador. Once again, she asked him, but who sent this to me? The young man turned, he was getting ready to walk out the door, and he said, ma'am, your husband sent it. Merry Christmas. She opened the letter. She read the words that her husband had written three weeks prior to his death, full of encouragement, admonishment, strength, reminding her that one day they would be together again. She wiped the tears from her eyes, picked up the pup, held it to her neck, and she suddenly realized, even in his death, her husband showed his love to her. May I tell you that through his death, Jesus Christ shows his love to you and to me. We need to understand today that the scripture is yet true. Hope is yet alive. Darkness cannot put out the light of Jesus Christ. It's time to stand and rejoice and say, I put my hope in Jesus Christ. He alone is worthy. Hebrews 6, 19, the writer said, This hope we have as an anchor of our soul, it is sure and steadfast. It's certain and dependable. Sure and steadfast. I've come to tell you this morning, God's always on time. He's never a minute late. He's never a minute early. He's always right on time. Regardless of where you're at or what you're dealing with, there is a God who wants to infuse you with hope today. Maybe you need forgiveness. Maybe you need restoration. Maybe you need healing. It doesn't matter. He provides it all when we put our trust and our hope in Him. Stand with me today, please. Because when hope is alive in our heart, the light of Christ shows, shines most clearly, and He pushes back the darkness that prevails around us. Bow your heads for a moment, please. I think it's very possible, highly likely and probable, there are people both in this room and online with us who've never asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins, never availed themselves to the hope that only comes through Him. This morning, the Holy Spirit has been convicting you, drawing you, challenging you, challenging everything you've ever thought about the Christmas season the coming of Christ, the gift that he is to the world, to all mankind. And this morning, you want to lay down your defenses, put aside your arguments, move past your apologetics, and you want to declare him to be the King of kings, Lord of lords, the Savior of my soul, the forgiver of my sins. That's you. You're in this room today, right where you stand, just lift a hand and say, pray for me, preacher. I want to put my trust in Jesus so hope can come alive in my heart and in my spirit. Pray for me. Pray for me. Yes, anyone else? Yes, anyone else? Pray for me. 
Yes, anyone else? Pray for me. Pray for me. Yes, someone else. Tom's going to begin to sing this beautiful song that we concluded worship with. The cross still stands, the blood still flows. If you raised your hand, I want you to step out and come. Meet us right here in the center of this altar area. We're going to pray with you and pray for you. God's going to touch you today. Maybe you're in the room and you just need hope infused into your life. Yes, step out and come. Don't wait for anybody else. Hope infused into your life. You're in a state of despair. And you know this is going to change. Step out and come. We're going to pray with you as well. You need hope. Come today. Tom, sing it out, would you? You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? Then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 1030 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.